educating people on how to get control of their lives financially. I can tell you that I stand here today financially sound because of information that Don gave me 10 years ago. So it is with a great deal of pride and a great deal of personal experience that I introduce to you Don Tucker. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Romans 13, 8. Have you ever wondered why God's Word warns us to stay out of debt? Hi, I'm Don Tucker. I am currently and have been for the last 18 years the Chief Financial Officer and the Head of the Tax Department at Worldwide Group. I've been a certified public accountant for 22 years and in the profession for 25 years. In all those years, there's one thing I've noticed is that it's real easy for people to get into debt and very difficult for them to get out. What I want to share with you now is a concept I call the dynamics of debt. This concept first occurred to me almost 20 years ago as I was preparing for an adult Sunday school class on your money and your marriage. As I was going through the material, suddenly a light bulb went on as to why it is so easy for people to get into debt and so difficult for them to get out. To show you this, I'd like to go through a little example with you. Assume you have a lifestyle in which you overspend by $20 each and every week. I'll give you two weeks off, so it's only $1,000 per year. And let's assume you do that for three years. So at the end of that three-year period, you're now in debt $3,000. At that point, you decide to stop and to pay off your debt. I've given you three years to get into debt. I'll give you three years to get out of debt. Here's what you need to do. First, you need to either stop the $20 per week overspending or earn enough more to cover that $20 per week overspending. For a year, that's $1,000. Next, you need to pay the interest. Assuming a 15% interest rate, you need to either reduce your lifestyle expenditures or earn enough more to pay the interest. That's an additional $450. Finally, you need to pay on the principal. Assuming you reduce the balance by one third each year, again, you either need to reduce your lifestyle expenditures or earn enough more to pay the principal. Again, that's $1,000. So for the first year, you need a total of $2,450 just to pay off one-third of the debt that took you three years to rack up. However, this is net after-tax money, which means the taxes must be paid first. So let's look at the tax considerations of a wage earner. Let's assume a low tax bracket of 15%. Remember the FICA and Medicare is 7.65%, and we'll ignore the state taxes for now. So your total tax rate is 22.65%. That means you have to have an increase of $3,167 this year just to have a net of $2,450, which enables you to pay the interest of $450, stop the spending of $1,000, and pay the first one-third of the principal of $1,000. If that's a raise, it's 10% of a $32,000 salary. But how many of us really get 10% raises? If it's a cost of living raise, it's 4% of a $79,000 salary. However, if your cost of living has gone up by 4%, that means nothing is left. By now, you're starting to get the idea of why it's so hard to get out of debt. But let's take this even a step further. Let's look at the tax considerations if you're self-employed. Will your net increase cover this $2,450? Let's assume a tax bracket of 30%. Medicare rate of 2.9%, because as you'll see, you'll be over the FICA limit. Average state tax of 8% for a total tax rate of 40.9%. This means you need an increase of $4,146 just to net the $2,450 to pay the $1,000 of principal, the $450 of interest, and stop the overspending of $1,000. So if your increase exceeds the cost of living by 5%, you would currently need to be making $82,910. Now you've seen by this very simple and I think very believable example how easy it is to get into $3,000 of debt. I saw some of the guys nudging their wives out there when we were talking about the $20 a week overspending. But let's face it, guys, we can spend that much in a good weekend just buying some of our toys, can't we? And yet, $3,000 takes us three years to get into, 
Look how hard it is to even get started the first year in paying it off. But let's look at what society offers us as solutions. First and foremost, more debt, easy terms, overdraft protection, tap your home equity, have another credit card coming in the mail every week. And what happens at the end result of all this? Bankruptcy. Obviously, society solutions don't work. But what are some real solutions? Well, you might get an inheritance or other windfall, but that's highly unlikely. You could do the most difficult thing and decrease your lifestyle. You could increase your income while keeping your lifestyle constant. But as you've seen, that is still very difficult to get out of debt. Finally, there is proper planning. And that's where I want to spend the rest of our time. And I promise I'll only use the B word once. That's budget. So let's look at the what, the why, and the how. First, what is debt? It's any money owed to anyone for anything. Borrowing is using something that belongs to someone else. Some examples are your home mortgage, auto loan, student loans, credit cards. It can also include contractual agreements for payments, such as auto leases, your home or apartment rent, even your taxes. Second, why get out of debt? You might hear, isn't some debt good? They're usually talking about leverage. That's the art of using other people's money to make you money. For a simplified example, assume you put $2,000 down on a $100,000 rental house. The rents are going to equal the payments, and you're going to sell that house five years later for $110,000. So at that time, you pay off your mortgage, 100,000 minus the two is 98,000, leaving you $12,000 on the investment of 2,000. That's six times what you started with in only five years. But leverage is fraught with risk, which is another way to say gambling. You don't know what the market might be like in five years. You don't know if that house will be vacant for any length of time. You don't know if the renters might cause a lot of damage. Leverage might be just another way to get further into debt. Next, debt causes bad things. First, servitude. Let's look at Proverbs 22, 7. And the borrower is a servant to the lender. In other words, when you owe somebody money, it's like you're working for them. Second is stress. You worry about your payment. Can you make it? Do I have the money to get it? Where is it going to come from? How do I do it? When do I do it? Third is sameness. Debt tends to trap you into a never-ending cycle of more debt. And as you've seen, it's very hard to get out of. Fourth is strife. It can bring separation between you and your spouse, you and your parents, you and whoever you might owe money to. And finally, as we've already looked at, it can cause bankruptcy. Again, let's look to God's word for some wisdom. Proverbs 22, verses 26 through 27. Do not be one of those who shakes hands in a pledge, one of those that guarantees debts. If you have nothing with which to pay, your very bed will be snatched from under you. The next why we should get out of debt involves stewardship. We should be responsible for those assets that have been entrusted to us. It involves managing your finances, which means we should control them. Don't let the finances control you. Psalm 37.21 tells us, the wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous give generously. Who amongst us wouldn't much rather be a giver than a debtor? Stewardship also involves training your children or teaching others. Your actions, your example, will speak much louder than your words. For example, take my son Joshua. Ever since he was little, we'd go on trips, he'd have a little pocket money to spend on mementos to bring back. Yet when we were there, he wasn't able to part with that cash. Then when we got home, he'd wish he'd have bought it. My wife and I joke, we call it non-buyer's remorse. And yet when we're at church and a missionary would come through and they'd talk about their trials and tribulations out in the field, that same boy would empty out his wallet into the offering plate. Now that son is now 20 years old. This spring he'll graduate with honors with a business degree from Seattle Pacific University. 
he is already planning on how he's going to buy his first car with cash. And he'd even like to try to figure out how he can buy his first house debt-free. For the final word on stewardship, we again need to look no further than at God's word. For in Matthew 6, verse 24, it says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So now, let me show you how to be master over your money and not have your money be master over you. The first step is to make a decision and commit to it. Every financial decision you make is ultimately a priority decision. You must make getting out of debt a priority. There is no such thing as an independent financial decision. Each choice you make will influence every future financial choice that you make. And it involves delayed gratification, which simply means giving up today's desires in order to meet future needs or desires. Once again, we can just go to God's Word to see some great examples. In Proverbs 6, it talks of the ant that lays up in the harvest and stores his goods for the summer. Or even to Genesis and the story of Joseph, where he convinces the ruler to save up grain for seven years so that they have plenty left during the famine of the next seven years. The next step is to set your goals. These goals need to be specifically measurable and attainable objectives. These goals will give you direction, motivation, and hope. Next, communicate. Share these goals with someone, but remember to be positive and be proactive. The past is past. Can't do anything about that. We're on a new road to step forward. And be accountable. Pick that person, whether it's your spouse, your upline, or a relative, and talk to them about your goals and how you're doing. Now it's time to get down to work. The first thing you need to do is to recap your spending. You need to do this for at least the last three months, but it's even better if you go back and do the entire year. All you need to do is create a simple spreadsheet, much like the one shown. You have different categories, such as tithe and contributions, house payment, utilities, groceries, or dining out. As you go through your own spending patterns, you'll see different categories to create. And while you're going through this, look for areas to conserve. This is where I use the budget word. If you want to go from this into a budget, now is a good time. But believe me, it's not necessary. You can still get out of debt with where you're at. But as you go through your spending, look for areas where you might be able to redirect some of your resources towards paying off debt. It has been my experience when working with people that just this step alone, they can identify almost 10% of their income that they can redirect. After you're done recapping your spending, the next thing you do is list all your debts. You'll need to write down the creditor, the balance owing, the interest rate, your monthly payment, and how many months of payment left. In the example shown, there are six creditors listed. As you can see, this person owes a total of $140,074.11. His monthly payments total $1,470.78. If he sticks strictly to the term, it would take him 27 years before he was out of debt. Now let's begin our plan with the goal of getting out of debt quick. The first thing to do is attack the smallest balance. We will be using money identified during your spending recap. So remember, you're now going to buy and spend wisely. Let me give you a few quick examples of what I mean by spending wisely. I would hazard a guess as you went through your spending recap, you saw that dining out was pretty expensive, especially when compared to eating at home. But even if you eat out, there's a couple things you can do. For example, I've done this with my kids, do it with yours. We have one order a small fry and another a medium fry. We dump them onto napkins on the table. See if you can tell which pile is larger. Same thing with the pop. It's all in the packaging, yet they try to get us to supersize these things. Better yet, drink water. Let's move on to cars. How many of us have bought a new car just because our old one needed tires? I have a 79 Corvette that I'm very proud of. I like to keep it looking good, running good. 
I've replaced the rear end, I've replaced the interior, I've had many tune-ups, and I've bought new tires for it. But you know, when I look back at all my spending, not once did I spend over $1,800 a year to keep that car running and looking good. That is only $150 a month. A lot less than a new car payment, isn't it? The point is, I think you too will be able to find some money that you can throw against your debt. When you're committed to getting out of debt, you should also use what I would call any extra money. This can be in the form of gifts, bonuses, raises, or perhaps a second business income. You attack the smallest balance first. In this example, Sears, $950 balance, 12% interest, $50 per month payment, would take you 22 months to pay it off. By adding only an additional $50 to the payment each month, you shorten that term down to 10 months. I recommend you stick this list on your fridge, and when that debt disappears, take a big red marker and mark through it, and then reward yourself. Go out to a nice dinner. You want to keep positive and enjoy this process. Now that that first payment's gone, what you do is add that $100 payment to the payment on the next size debt. In other words, in our example, Dr. Smith was at $75 a month. You kept paying that for the first 10 months while you were paying off Sears. But now that Sears is gone, you can take that $100 and add it to the 75, so you now have a $175 payment. Look what happens. It only takes 10 more months to pay off Dr. Smith. So instead of 35 months out from the start of the plan, you're only 20 months out. Continue in this manner on down your worksheet, adding the payment as it disappears against the payment of the next highest debt. Let's pause for a moment on the MasterCard. For this example, I used a typical card, $5,000 balance, a 2.5% minimum payment, or $10, whichever is greater, plus a $25 annual fee, all at a 14.99% interest rate. If you only make minimum payments, and several of you probably are very happy to only make minimum payments, but if you make the minimum payment on this card, it takes you 321 months to pay that off. That is 26 years and nine months. And in that time, you would have spent a total of $10,969. If that interest rate should go up to 18%, it takes you 34 years and seven months to pay it off, and you would have spent $14,086.49. Let's take an extreme example on the same card. If your interest rate is 24.99%, which is what they get to if you've had any credit trouble, it would take 120 years for the balance just to get down to $500. At the 100-year mark, your balance would still be $540, and you would have paid in $41,675.45 to the credit card company. Do you see why they encourage you to only make the minimum payments? It is like highway robbery. Now let's get back to our plan. As you continue to pay off the debt and add that payment to the payment on the next debt, you can see it greatly shortens the length of time that you'll be paying on the debts. As you get down to the car loan, you're now into the plan 40 months. The balance of the car loan at that time is now only $7,418.98. But now your payment jumps up to $681.72. It only takes 11 more months for you to pay off that car. So now you're 51 months into the plan and you attack your mortgage. The balance at that time has only come down to $105,794.67. But your payment can go up to a whopping $1,520.78. As you can see, that means you only have 92 months left on your mortgage bringing the grand total for the whole plan to be completely debt-free to 143 months. So in less than 12 years, you're completely out of debt. All you've done was add $50 to your initial payment and then continue to dedicate all debt payments 
to the next higher debt until it was paid off. Even though it just took us less than 12 years to get out of debt, you may have noticed that not once during that entire time did we ever add any additional income. No gifts, no bonuses, no raises, no secondary income. In fact, all we did was add $50 to the initial payment and then dedicate all debt payments to just that debt and never transferred it to another. If indeed you become committed to this type of plan, there are even other things you can do to help speed up this process. For example, you can trade your balance on a high interest rate credit card to a low interest rate credit card and pay less out. You can consolidate loans, combine them, but again, do not ever increase the balance. Do that only to reduce your payment and your interest rate. And finally, even refinance your home. And again, do not take any more out than you already have owed, but to do it to get a lower interest rate so that you can just pay things off even faster using all the debt payments that you've now saved. The biggest thing to remember now is that you need to avoid the temptation to break your new habit. For example, if you're considering a purchase that's going to require monthly payments, do this. Before actually making the purchase, determine what the monthly payment would be. And then for three months, make that payment into a savings account. This accomplishes three things. First, it proves that your cash flow can handle the payment. Second, it may provide a down payment that you can put down on the purchase that will even lower your debt. And third, you may have so much fun putting the money into savings, you'll forget entirely about the purchase and keep the money. Remember, borrowing money may deny God the opportunity to show himself faithful. As Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply all your need according to his riches in glory. I have now given you the tools and the processes that if you implement, you can enjoy a debt-free, stress-free life sooner than you ever imagined. I trust you have enjoyed my Dynamics of Debt presentation. May God bless your efforts to become debt-free. I still watch that and I'm still amazed at how well that works. Isn't that amazing when you think about it? Just 50 bucks and it can shorten uh, the time you're in debt. And of course, life happens in between and everything, but it's, it's a process just to uh, stay on, be committed to, you know, is the, is the thing we do. And 12 years even seems like a long time, but you know, uh, like when we did that, and it, first of all, I guess it's only 20 years ago, so uh, it lost some time. I thought I did it sooner than that, but um, you know, my, I had a goal to get out, complete out of debt, pay our house off by the time I was 40, and which is also the time the kids would be starting college, just to have that. But by, because we added raises and, you know, at least half a raise, I, we'd put against debt. Uh, bonuses, same thing. You know, we might enjoy half, but we'd put half of it against the debt, gifts, that kind of thing. And so we were actually, uh, had our first house uh, totally debt free when we were 38, when I was 38. And it took eight years instead of 12. So just, you know, just to encourage you, uh, it, like I say, that's only adding 50 bucks uh, to the thing. So let's go through the worksheet so you can kind of fill that out and keep it as a reminder, uh, help dedicate that. So we had the debt scenario where uh, you overspend by $20 a week, you know, and uh, give you two weeks off. That, uh, so for 50 weeks, that means $1,000 uh, 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 a year. And you do that at the end of the first year. You do that for three years. Or three. Th and again, I, this is probably low nowadays. I mean, obviously, uh, you can add a zero to that pretty easily in a lot of cases. But just to kind of uh, recap the math, we show you make the decision after three years. Okay, I'm tired of debt. I'm getting out. Um, so, uh, you're kind of falling off. so you get out of debt, uh, plan year one. Step one, you need to first stop that overspending or make enough money to cover it. You know, either way, it's a $1,000 blow to your lifestyle. Okay. Step two, you need to pay the interest. And a lot of these obviously are a little simplified calculations, but you know, it's the, the same. So 
uh, 15% interest, uh, $450. Uh, step three is then to pay that first third of the principal back. So that's another thousand. So the summary there is that uh, just to pay the interest, stop the bleeding, and pay the principal, you need 2,450 just that first year on a $3,000 debt. You know, you've spent almost the same amount of money and you're only a third of the way. It gets pretty crazy. Well, uh, at that point, we want to review 13.8, Romans 13.8. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. That's what scripture tells us to do. That's why we make the decision to do that. You know, maybe, maybe you owe them a debt of gratitude, maybe a cup of sugar, you know. Uh, so today, uh, we want to give our definition of what we're talking about uh, is debt is any money owed to anyone for any reason. I don't care who it is. If you owe money, you know, if you borrow uh, $50 from your kid, you know, or, or your parents, that you owe money for whatever the reason was. That's what, if it involves the money, that's what we're talking about today. And again, we, uh, the video talked about what are society's solution? You know, what is our culture and every TV ad that comes on, uh, what does it tell us to do? You know, uh, they want, to, uh, want us to take on more debt. You know, I tell people all the time, the, the banks and especially the credit card, uh, they're as evil if not more evil than the IRS. <laughs> you know, I, I treat them both equally. <laughs> they, they're all, they just want our money. And they're happy to do whatever they can to get more of it. And we just got to keep that. They are not our friend, even though uh, they, uh, they do want to give us easy terms or, or overdraft protection. I always love uh, going into the bank, you know, setting up a new account. And, they, well, we'll give you overdraft protection, you know, and it's only $20 if you go over, if you, uh, you know, if you bounce a check. And I go, why would I bounce a check? And they kind of looked at me, go, no, I don't want that. I'm not going to pay an extra five bucks a month or even the, the $20 fee that that's going to happen. I am not <laughs> going to bounce a check. You know, and just, it's just, again, that attitude that uh, we want to control our money. We're not going to let these people control what we do or how we uh, live. Tap your home equity. Uh, you know, and I mentioned in there, sometimes there's good... Uh, reasons to do that I uh, you know this a lot of this but it just in the the mindset of the society telling us what to do and encouraging us on how to do it uh, get another credit card my goodness I know you're all getting those in the mail all the time you know 20 years ago 30 years ago you know just build up get more debt and the end result of that is indeed bankruptcy uh, you know if you just keep going the, the wrong way uh, you know, in society, they'll say, oh, you know, that, that, you can do that and then get out and, you know, they'll leave you alone. I think in my 35 years of, of practicing, uh, I actually recommend it maybe twice, you know, that where things were so bad uh, that, that uh, they could do it. But as you see, it's not that hard if you get on a good plan to get yourself out and not have all that stigma or even the guilt of going bankruptcy. There's just different uh, things to do, but um, sometimes to take the pressure off or, or, you know, stop the phone call, save the marriage or all that kind of, I had papers filled out, actually. Uh, a business, for initial business with a partner that took some funds and, and ended up bad. And, and uh, I just uh, could not bring myself after some of this stuff to, uh, to sign the papers. And lo and behold, it was uh, with the landlord that was kind of facing it, that, you know, the, the office we had anyway, kind of skipped all that. And uh, uh, they, they were going to hold me responsible for his half, whatever. They finally, finally called me and, and said, uh, okay, if you just pay off your half, we'll separate it out. You know, and then God blessed, blessed the decision to not do it. And then a couple years I had them paid off. So just... Uh, you know, sometimes it, you almost, it, you don't want to challenge God per se, but you just need to listen to him, you know, and, and what he's telling you to do. And I was just really convicted not to, to do it. And he, he, he honors that. I truly believe that. So what do we want are real solutions. Uh, real solutions to getting out uh, inheritance or a windfall. You know, uh, some of you uh, might be fortunate enough to get an inheritance. 
you know, or a sizable one, and, and praise God. It's just then how do you use that or whatever. A windfall, you know, people think of winning the lottery. Well, uh, you know, it, it, that'd be a windfall, uh, you know, for sure. Um, you know, I had a client that uh, had very wealthy, had racehorses and were into that. And, and fortunately, uh, she really got into betting on the ponies. And uh, so they end up losing their horse, their horse farm. She, however, did not lose her gambling addiction, which some will say is worse than, than cocaine and all. Uh, she would go to the casino and just bet and bet and bet and bet. And pretty, didn't take too long, probably about, like I say, they're so wealthy, I'd say 10 years. She had lost a, a $10 million estate, gone, just totally gone. And she ran off and, you know, anyway, ugly story. But you just, you got to get out of some of the, the uh, mindsets and, and addictions if you feel coming on into uh, that. Uh, number two, uh, and I mentioned there, probably the hardest one to do is decrease that lifestyle. You know, start, uh, save some of that money. You know, it's taking a step back and, and uh, decreasing it there and, and while keeping the same income. You know, and you just uh, find somewhere where that you can redirect some resources from. Uh, and, or at least freeze it. You know, you get a raise, don't run out and buy a new car. You know, everybody, like so many people, clients that... You know, they get a $200 raise, and they go out and say, oh, I got $200 to buy for a new car payment, right? Well, they forget when they get their paycheck of the $200 raise, there's only $120 in, in their net check. And they go, whoa, what happened? Well, $80 went to the government. And, and so they're more in debt. It's just, it's just one of those things that, to get our uh, thinking right. Uh, number three, you can in increase income. You know, get a... Uh, that's also very hard. It can cause some uh, strife and uh, stress as well. Uh, maybe the spouse gets a job or whatever. Next week, we'll talk about how that isn't a very good strategy, and we'll point out why that is. Uh, it has to do with taxes and all. Um, but it's a, it is a solution. You know, some second income uh, can help out to, to start doing this, which all boils down to uh, number four there is proper planning, the B word. Uh, you know, um, you said, uh, to, to just to plan and to stick to a plan. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have a line item budget, but let's have a plan in place to move forward on this stuff. All right. Uh, you may have heard and you might ask, but can't debt be good? Can't some debt be good? Well, uh, uh, and we talked, uh, talked about leverage and it can be good. You might, you could hit a real home run with it. But it is full of risk, you know. Uh, if you're involved in having to sell a house during the housing, uh, you know, crisis back in 2008, you know, you end up losing money if you have to move. And, and uh, still, uh, so you just want to be, you want to have a plan in place to get around that stuff. And you know, today's market is is so uh, is so inflated so much, it might not go away, but it might. So you just want to be careful in what you uh, do with that. Uh, it's really uh, another form of gambling if you're trying to leverage something. You know, if I'm buying, uh, especially if it's an investment property and I'm, I'm betting on it going up, and I've had clients do that, where they bet it was going to go up, uh, all of a sudden the mortgage comes due and they can't sell it, uh, and now they're in trouble, you know, and uh, they just because they can't handle it. Well... Uh, the second, you, it can lead to a better credit score. Credit scores are a big deal. It helps you get better rates if you're getting a car loan and if you're uh, buying a house. Uh, but, uh, boy, if you, don't, if you miss a payment, watch that credit rate fall. You know, it can really uh, cost you because that's what a credit uh, score is really for is so you can get more debt. Again, it's just the way they encourage us to get more and more debt. And you want, yeah, you want to build up a, 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 a history of good debt payments and have a good score, but don't be encouraged then to just get more and more of it, all right? Because debt can cause a lot of bad things. It causes a lot of bad things. Uh, they're listed there on your worksheet. Uh, servitude, uh, Proverbs 22, 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is a servant to the lender. You really end up working, you know, what you used to call it in the city, working for the man, 
you know, you're, you're working to pay off a bank or pay off a credit card. That's a bad excuse to be working. You don't, you don't stay happy in your job <laughs> doing that kind of thing because you feel like you're not even making your own money. You're just making it for somebody else. And in a lot of our cases, you are. Uh, causes stress, frustration, or the sameness we talked about. You, just, you're, you get in this cycle, it's just more and more debt piling up, and that's frustrating. Uh, causes strife. It does definitely, as if the marriage class or whatever you're doing, there's strife in the family, strife with the kids. Nothing can uh, cause the stressful uh, thing on, on your life than, than having debt. And then the bankruptcy that's listed there. Uh, again, the, 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 the possibly the end result. Uh, I had a friend in high school, even back then, where we'd heard, you know, his dad had declared uh, bankruptcy seven times. I mean, it's even amazing you can do that kind of thing. Some of that's almost purposeful, which, would, you know, that's uh, sinful. It'd be another uh, word for that, to do that kind of thing. Uh, and not listed there, but you, uh, don't be a guarantor for another's debt. You know, I've seen that uh, destroy more family relationships than anything. You know, sign this loan for your kid, you know, or, or uh, sign a loan, which can be a great thing to do. But you want to do it with the attitude uh, that, to knowing that if they don't make the payment, you're going to. And you, and you should better be okay with that. Because eight times out of ten, that is what's going to happen. If you guarantee somebody's debt and they know you've guaranteed it, hey, Uncle Don will pay it. I'm out of here. So just, you know, and it's just one of, if you really love them, uh, you don't want to cause that stress in the relationship. You know, or just be very careful or willing to, to be mentally willing to make it as a gift if they don't pay you back. You know, uh, I can say that now. We'd do that with the kids, you know. They'd, they'd owe us money, and, you know, but it would, if they didn't pay us back, it was going to be a gift. Don't tell them that, <laughs> you know. It's just one of those things. Because you want them to be responsible and learn to grow up and do this stuff. You want to help? Anyway, uh, especially if you've got a windfall. You always hear the story. People come out of the wood, relatives out of the woodwork to get a piece of the, your windfall. Wanting to, you know, hey, you can afford to help me out now. I'll pay you back. 98% of the time, they don't pay you back. I, from what I've seen, it's just, uh, it's just fraught with great risk. And uh, Proverbs 22, 26 through 27 says just that. Be not thou one of them that strike hands or them that are sureties for debts. If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? You know, you, you're going to end up losing if you're guaranteeing something. All right. Uh, let's get my pages mixed up here. Sorry. Oh, where to go? Ah, so... What is um, a letter uh, E there, getting out of debt, is good stewardship. It's just good stewardship to get out of debt, to what God entrusts us. It's about being responsible. It's about uh, managing your finances. Control your money. Don't let it control you. You know, like with the bank example. I'm going to control my bank balance. I don't want the bank controlling my bank balance. Take control of that. Uh, control your own money. And then teaching others or to be a good example to others, uh, especially children, uh, because actions, uh, oh, sorry, actions do speak louder than words. You know, what you show your kids, how they grow up, as we talked last week, that affects what they do when they grow up, but they saw mom and dad do it, you know. So we want our actions to be a good example, to be an example to, to other church members or, or to other family members, whoever it might be. Uh, Psalm 37, 21, the wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. You know, we talked before, you know, you'd rather, much rather uh, be a giver and to give mercy, you know. And uh, it doesn't say the wicked borroweth, the wicked borroweth and payeth not again. You know, if, if you do it with the intent of never paying back or something happens, then we have a problem. So F, how do you master your money? How do you master your money and to get out of debt? Well, number one, you make the decision to commit. You commit to that decision. Every financial decision is a priority decision. To realize you're showing where your priorities are with how you spend the money. 
Every choice you make influences every future financial choice. You know, what you do today, what you decide to do, is going to affect what you do tomorrow and the next day. Uh, number two is delayed gratification. Not just putting off uh, desires today to meet future needs or desires. Just put it off. You know, store it up for three months, like in the example. You know, and I know I'm going through this fast, and there is a handout included that you can will help with some of this, but I wanted to get through it this morning. Uh, three, set your goals. And you remember last week we said, uh, 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 you know, a goal without a plan is just a wish. You want to set a goal. Uh, that goal uh, needs to be uh, measurable and attainable. You know, I could stand up here and say, boy, my goal is to have a million dollars more in the bank next week. You know, how? I don't buy lottery tickets, you know. So that's not going to, so, but you want, so you want to have a goal that you can get to. You know, you don't want to make something that's so unattainable you give up in another week. Make sure it's attainable. Uh, good goals um, give direction. It gives you a path. It gives you that, the plan to do if you have a good goal. Good goals give you motivation. You know, we were motivated to pay our house off before the kids started college. Whatever, whatever your hot button is to motivate you, you know, I want to buy that new car with cash. It's great motivation. Nothing wrong with that. And uh, your goal would be good for that. And finally, good goals give hope. You know, if you have a goal that you know is attainable, uh, we can be help hopeful to get there. Yeah, we, you know, this is great. And, and it helps you just have that positive attitude, which leads number four, you need to communicate uh, that goal. Share your goals, uh, be positive and proactive. And again, the past is past, no use. Well, I remember when you spent that and you went off and bought that, you know, uh, why, you got those snowmobiles, we could have, uh, you, know, you know, got me a new dress. Whatever the conversation might be, uh, doesn't matter. That's past. Let's be positive and proactive uh, there. Uh, and then be accountable. You know, whether it's your spouse or, or a friend or a pastor, whatever it might be. Here's my goal. Help me stay on track. Talk about it. Communicate. Uh, once again, our class uh, verse, Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You make a pick. You make a choice today which one you're going to serve, you're going to be with. So, um, so that means now it's time to get to work. You've got to get to work. How are we going to do that? Well, as we shared last week, we gave you the worksheet. Recap your spending for at least the last three months. Do the, do the categories, make the spreadsheet, whatever, to figure out where your money's been going. You have to figure out where it's going. That chart I included last week to help you do that, and, and, and an extra one as well. Uh, while you do that, you look for areas to conserve. Where can I come up with 50 bucks to start this plan? Where can I come up with $500 to be, you know, but you can, you can spot those areas. Uh, I guarantee you, just by doing that sp uh, spreadsheet or that worksheet, you'll, you'll see where you can save money. Maybe, I read this morning, turn your thermostat down two degrees. You know, it might free up $50 a month. Just all of these different kind of things. Look for things you can do. Uh, then uh, actually redirect resources. Take some of that, okay, I saved $50 on going out. It goes against my debt. You redirect it from this area to this one after you've identified where it's at. So finally, and this is the most important uh, step, is uh, list all your debts. There's another worksheet there. Uh, what do I owe? You, and you need to list them out. The creditor, you, you take some research. What's the current balance? Uh, what's the uh, rate of interest? What is my monthly payment? Or how much have I been paying monthly? And the term, how long would that make it last? You just, you need to, you know, and you just sit down, okay, there's the car payment, there's the house payment, there's the student payment, there's the MasterCard, there's the Visa, there's Dr. Smith, you know, and uh, that's uh, the example there on the next uh, illustration in your, in your workbook there is that, that first, the left half was on the screen. Just a typical, a very typical family. Remember last week I said the average debt's 145000 uh, with the mortgage, and this comes up to one hundred and forty. And, and you just look, and eventually, there's two worksheets, one of them just as you research them, write them down. Then take the clean one 
and, and put them in order. And you do it in the uh, balance owed first. You know, that, that's a key uh, to do that because then you want to attack your debt. You're going to attack your debt as part of your decision, which means you spend wisely and attack the smallest debt first. They always debate whether it's the smallest one or the highest at interest rate. You know, it kind of makes mental sense. Well, why don't I attack the 25% interest rate first? Because it's so hard at, at just adding a small additional payment. Where you get rid of the small one, uh, that one, then you free up that entire payment. You know, and that's, that's that worksheet. See, and then you can add that to the next one. So when, when that uh, first payment drops off, your debt payments stay debt payments. So you get rid of one, you add that payment to the next one. And that's called the snowball effect. You know, you get that snowball effect working for you instead of going the opposite way. You know, now we got the snowball uh, coming our way. And that's when you look at the second half of that table uh, that's up there or it's in your sheet, the results. And if you, again, you notice the, the total payments on the left half is $1,470. 78 cents. On the right, if you look at the very last payment, because of all your debts have been rolled into it, um, on the home, it's 1520 dollars $50 is all you've done in those 12 years. We added it one time, rolled the debt. And, yeah, you know, again, if you can add uh, different hits as you go, all the better. Okay? So, uh, basically, the whole principle of Christian stewardship, again, means we're using the resources God has entrusted to us to accomplish his plans and his purposes. That's really what we want to do, is be able to accomplish what he has for us. Okay? So, uh, you have those spreadsheets there. Then the next few pages, it's called the Dynamics of Debt. It's pretty much all this recap. You can pull it out and review it, because we, we flew through it today. Read them, study them, put them into practice and do all that. Uh, the additional worksheet, so you can just get things uh, cleanly and in order to do that. Uh, be sure to and just attack it. And like I said in the video, you know, when you, on the fridge, big, or on your bedroom, if you don't want the neighbors to see it, you know, big red line and celebrate, you know, have a good time. We got rid of that one, let's go after the next one. You're, you're in attack mode in this thing. All right, so uh, with that, uh, we, uh, well, let's just pray, and then we'll get to the closing slides. Father, we thank you for your word and on the valuable uh, resources you have provided us with. Help us, Lord, to be good Christian stewards of those. Lord, to attack our debt, learn how to live within our means, and, and that you can uh, rely on you to supply all our needs that we have. And Lord, we can be more faithful with our finances and take control of those. So we bless this time together, bless all those uh, to embark on this journey with us. We ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name, amen. So what I want to do, uh, challenge and reward you this week, if you'll fill out those worksheets, if you'll do those three months um, of recap and do this debt, uh, if you don't, uh, I won't look at the particular monitors, but just flash them at me that, hey, I did it. I'm going to give you a $5 uh, coffee gift card, all right? And just, uh, so next week, come and show me, or in the next couple weeks, hey, I did my homework. I'm going to give you a $5 uh, coffee gift card, and, uh, and you know, just, uh, uh, just fill those worksheets out. It, it, it's a valuable exercise. I can't stress that enough. Just to, just in doing that, you started the plan. You started the plan. All right. So uh, next week, uh, we're going to study uh, closely related to debt for good or bad, uh, materialism, and harmony in the home. Because money is so important in the stress it causes there. That's, I think Pastor Josh will be back and, and share in the uh, teaching of that. But, uh, you know, we just want to encourage you all that... Uh, it, it's a wonderful way to live, isn't it, dear? To not have any debt and worry about it. And to have a plan working together during the years you aren't out of debt. Just to, to get there. Uh, working together instead of against each other and all that strife it can cause. So with that, uh, you're dismissed. We are going to sing. Uh, our, our, our song's going to come up. What a friend we have in Jesus. 
He is our friend. He wants the best for us. And his word will help us do that. God bless. Thanks for tuning in and coming this morning.